Hi, welcome back. I'm scientist Kate. This is grade three, weather and climate. Lesson 3.6, evaluating evidence about climate, part one. For this lesson, you will need a pencil or something to write with, and you could really use some crayons or markers. If you don't have crayons or markers though, it's okay. You're also gonna need notebook page 52. It's called Visualizing Future Weather. What's the weather like where you are today? Here in Seattle, it's pretty rainy and gray, and it's also a little cool. Are you ready to do some science today? I bet you are. Let's go. All right, welcome back. Do you remember the last lesson? We compared Seattle's average temperature and precipitation to three other major cities. And we were trying to find a city that has a climate that's similar to Seattle's. So today we're gonna study how can we predict what the weather in a place will be like many years from now? Because that would be really useful to be able to do to help us pick a place for our orangutan reserve. Have you ever thought about what the weather might be like on your 18th birthday? That's several years in the future, right? Well, if you think about it now, you could go ahead and pick out an outfit that you might wanna wear on your 18th birthday. We're gonna use notebook page 52 to do that. So let's review the directions. We're gonna use our local weather graphs to visualize and draw on page 52. So here's what you do. I'm gonna show you some weather graphs and you're gonna find the month you were born on the graphs for local temperature and precipitation. Then you're gonna visualize what you would be wearing and doing on your 18th birthday. Draw a picture of what you visualized and then share your drawing with a partner. Now, you probably don't have a partner at your house, but I bet there is somebody you could show your picture to. Now, I'm gonna model this for you first so that you have a really good idea of what to do when you do it on your own. These are the two temperature graphs we saw for the climate of Seattle in the last lesson. Do you remember these graphs? Awesome. So the green one says average high temperatures in Seattle, Washington, and the blue one says average total precipitation in Seattle, Washington. Now, remember that these graphs aren't from a specific year. They're not from 1989. They're not from 2001. These are graphs that are made from average data that scientists made by looking at years and years and years of data and finding what the average temperature is for each month and precipitation. So um, I'm gonna do this first for my own birthday and I'll show you how to do it. My birthday is July 19th. I'm a summer baby. And looking at these graphs, I'm gonna point to the month of July. And then I'm gonna point over here to the month of July. So this is what you're gonna do with your own birthday month when it's your turn. So looking at these graphs, for temperature, I should expect around 70 to 80 degrees. And I figured that out by going to the top of the July bar and then going over here and seeing that it's in between 70 and 80 degrees. Now I'm gonna compare that to the temperature benchmarks that we used in chapter one. Do you remember that? It shows you like what each temperature kind of looks like. So 70 degrees is about what your classroom feels like. And 93 degrees was what temperature um, chocolate melts at. So I can expect on my birthday for it to be warmer than the classroom, but not hot enough to melt chocolate. Now let's look at the precipitation. July, great. It looks like there's not gonna be a big chance of rain in July. There's very little rain here in Seattle in the summer like that. So I'm gonna show you three outfits that I've picked out for my birthday. Now y'all, here's a little secret, but don't tell anybody. I'm way past my 18th birthday. So let's say that I'm planning for hmm, my 40th birthday. Here are three outfits that I want you to look at and choose which one best matches this weather data. Ready? The first outfit is an orange sweater, jeans, and boots. The second outfit is a jean jacket, a tank top, shorts, and sandals. And the third outfit is a heavy raincoat, jeans, 
and rain boots. Take a look at these three pictures and compare them to the weather I can expect on my 40th birthday. Pick an outfit that you think looks right. Did you pick an outfit that you think matches the weather data? Point to it right now. Are you pointing to this outfit? It's like I read your mind. The outfit with the orange sweater is probably a little bit too heavy and too warm for this temperature that I'm expecting. So 70 to 80 degrees is pretty warm. Um, and then this outfit here on the bottom is way too much for July. We're not expecting rain, so I can leave the rain boots at home in the raincoat. And I'm not gonna need gloves and a heavy coat because it's gonna be pretty warm. So this outfit is actually the best outfit for me to wear. Awesome. Now it's your turn. I'm gonna put these graphs up and I want you to find your birthday month and draw what you might be wearing on your 18th birthday. Pause the video now, complete page 52, and then meet me back here. All right, welcome back. Remember, we want to figure out which island will continue to have the best weather for orangutans for many years to come. We're going to look at new evidence from the islands today. Are you ready? Great. Before we do, I want to remind you about evaluating evidence. Do you remember what it means to evaluate something? It means to judge like how useful it is. So in chapter one, we were trying to compare one place to another and we decided that a piece of strong evidence must be measured in the same way that meteorologists measure. So for example, if we're measuring temperature, we wanna be measuring in degrees Fahrenheit. And if we're measuring rainfall, we wanna be measuring in millimeters, right? And we decided that a piece of weak evidence would be things that are measured in a different way, like that's not consistent. And we also don't want evidence that's just a description. So it's not strong evidence for us to say, oh, it's really hot and rainy outside today. Like that's not an actual measurement. Then in chapter two, we were predicting what the weather will continue to be. Remember how y'all did that with scientist Cynthia? And y'all decided that a piece of strong evidence would be a month of data because it gives you such a bigger time span and a weak piece of data or I'm sorry, a weak piece of evidence would be one day of data. It's just not enough to be able to predict what might happen in the future. So today we're gonna to be comparing some new evidence, right? Take a look at this evidence card. On the top, it says, someone measured the temperature every day for the month of June, 2010. The range was 55 degrees to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. The evidence on the top gives the temperature range in June 2010. Does it measure in an official meteorologist's measurement? Yeah, it measures in degrees Fahrenheit and it tells us the temperature range for one month. What about on the bottom? What do you notice about this piece of evidence? This piece of evidence it shows the average monthly temperatures for every month in 2010. So the evidence on the top is one single month of June, and the evidence on the bottom is one entire year for all of 2010. What does the evidence on the top allow us to predict? Think about it and tell me your answer. Yeah, we could use it to predict the temperature on the next few days of that month in 2010. What else? We could use it to predict the June temperature in other years. So we could look at that temperature range and say, hmm, if it was between 55 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit in June 2010, we could expect the same thing in June 2011, June 2012, June 2020, June 2030. We could use it to predict years in the future but only for the month of June. What does the bottom piece of evidence allow us to predict? Yeah, we could predict the temperature in every other month in any other year. So on the top, we could use that for just June, 
But on the bottom, we could use that for the entire year. I could predict the expected temperature for any year in the future and any month of the year. So which piece of evidence would make a stronger argument for the island that would have the best weather for orangutans in the future? Yeah, I'm probably going to go with the bottom piece of evidence because if we just look at the islands in June, what if one of the islands suddenly gets freezing cold in January? Or what if it dries up and, and there's no rain for the orangutans in some month? We need to look at the entire year in order to be able to make predictions. So just to wrap up, one month of data can help us predict the weather in the next few days, but that doesn't mean the place will be that same way every month. One year of data helps us predict future weather because the weather in one year is close to what the weather will be every year. So this is a place's climate, and climate is what we need to know to pick the island. So we're going to add a new row to the bottom of the evaluating new evidence chart. In the last chapter, chapter two, we were trying to predict what the weather would be for the next few days, and a month of data will let us do that. But now we want to predict what the weather will continue to be for years and years and years, right? We need to know that for the orangutan reserve. So we need one year of data. And now one day and one month are going to be weak evidence. All right. Thanks for joining me for lesson 3.6, Evaluating Evidence About Climate, Part 1. When you come back for Part 2, we're going to sort out some evidence to see what evidence is strong and what is weak. And hopefully we will be able to decide which island is the one we want to make an argument for to the Wildlife Protection Organization. Thanks so much for joining me today. And until I see you for part two, stay safe and stay curious. Bye. Hi, welcome back. I'm scientist Kate. This is grade three weather and climate. Lesson 3.6, Evaluating Evidence About Climate, Part 2. For this lesson, you will need a pencil or something else to write with and notebook page 54. Are you excited to do science today? I'm so excited because I'm hoping today we're going to get to decide which island the orangutan reserve should be on. Are you ready to do some science? Let's go. All right, do you remember part one of this lesson? We found our birthdays on the average temperature and average precipitation graphs for Seattle and decided what we would wear on an upcoming birthday. In this part of the lesson, we're going to be sorting evidence cards. So we're trying to answer the question over many years, which island is the best for an orangutan reserve? And we decided that when we evaluate new evidence, we need to be looking for one year of data not just one day or one month. So if we're actually gonna look at what the climate of these islands are, we need to be aware of what the temperature and precipitation are like throughout the entire year. We don't want to look for a month of data anymore. That helped us in chapter two, figure out what the weather was gonna be for the next few days, but we're moving on past that and we wanna now know what the weather will continue to be for many years so that we can make the best choice for the orangutans. All right, are you ready to sort some evidence? Remember to think about what we're looking for in good evidence. We're looking for official measurements like degrees Fahrenheit and millimeters, and we're looking for a year of data rather than just a day or a month. All right, here we go. Take a look at this evidence card. It's showing us Arc Island's daily high temperatures in August. Do you think this is a strong piece of evidence or a weak piece of evidence when we argue for which island we think the reserve should be on? Think about it and point to the side you think it should go to. This is a weak piece of evidence. Even though it does take measurements in degrees Fahrenheit, which is great, it's only showing us a month and we decided we're looking for a full year. All right, let's go. What do you think about this? It shows us Blue Island's high temperatures in August. Yeah, that's a weak piece of data for our purpose too. What about this one? 
Creek Island's daily high temperatures in August. Yep, you're really getting the hang of this. This is a weak piece of evidence. What about this one? Blue Island's total precipitation in August. Hmm. It does take the measurement in millimeters, which is the official way that meteorologists measure. But it's only giving us a month's worth of information and we want a year. So we're gonna put it in the week pile. How about this evidence card? Creek Island's total precipitation in August. Yep, that's week two. Can we get a strong piece of evidence, please? Oh, what is this? The 2010 average high temperatures on Arc Island. Hmm, is this measured in degrees Fahrenheit? Yep, I see up the side, temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. We're good to go. Does this show us a month or does it show us the full year? It shows us the full year. Awesome. So this is definitely a piece of strong evidence. Woohoo! Okay, what about this? The 2015 precipitation on Arc Island. It rained a lot all year. Well, this is telling us all year. Oh yeah, but it's not telling us an actual measurement in millimeters. So we have to move on and put it in the weak pile. All right, what about evidence card 26? The 2015 temperatures on Blue Island were that it was hot all year. Is that strong or weak? Yep, that is weak data because it doesn't have an official um, meteorologist measurement. We can't just say, oh, it was hot, it was cold, it rained some. Those aren't official ways that we measure. Okay, what about this? Yeah, this is also strong data. It's showing us the average high temperatures on Blue Island for the whole year. What about this evidence? Yeah, this is also strong data. It's showing us the average high temperatures on Creek Island. You're doing great. What about this one? 2010's monthly total precipitation on Arc Island. Hmm, I see that it's measured in millimeters right here. Does it show us a full year? Yep, it sure does. We're gonna put it in the strong pile. All right, so we've sorted all of our evidence cards and I'm gonna get rid of all of the weak ones. We don't wanna use those anymore because they're not gonna help us strongly and confidently and boldly and accurately make an argument about our island. So here's what I want you to do. Take out page 54 from your notebook that I told you to get at the beginning of the lesson, and let's review the directions. Directions. Number one, list the evidence card numbers for cards with strong evidence for comparing and predicting the weather for many years in the left column. And over here, you're gonna put the weak evidence card numbers in the right column. And then answer these two items using the evidence card that is shown. So I'm gonna pause the video and I want you to finish page 54 and then meet me back here. All right, I'll see you in a few minutes. Hi, welcome back. Did you finish page 54? Great. While you were gone, I took our strong evidence and I sorted them out into a table so that it's easier for us to understand. So I put the evidence cards here that were associated with Arc Island. And I put the evidence card here that's associated with blue. And this is Creek Island. So as you can see, we have all of the temperature data for all three islands for a full year. That's great. That's really gonna help us with our argument. Are we missing any data for th that we might need to make our decision? Yeah, we're missing precipitation data for Blue Island and for Creek Island. So that's kind of a problem because we can't compare unless we have all of the data for all of the islands. Does that make sense? We can't just guess about what a year's worth of precipitation would be like in Blue and Creek Islands. We need to know it for sure because scientists don't just guess at things. They have to have evidence to support their arguments. And we're scientists. All right. So we know that we're in need of some data and there's really only one way to get it. We need the help of the Wildlife Protection Organization. 
So I'm going to give them a call this weekend and see if I can get some more information from them. But do you remember what data we need to ask them for? Yeah, we need the precipitation data for Creek Island and Blue Island. And for what time period should I ask them? Is it cool if they just send us a month of data? No, we need a full year of data about precipitation on Creek and Blue Island. Now, how should this data be measured? Is it okay if they send us something that says it rained a lot all year? No. Is it okay if they send us something that was measured in buckets? No. What about in, um, if they send, if they sent us something measured in feet? No, we have to have it measured in what? Millimeters, nailed it. All right, perfect. All right, I'm gonna call the Wildlife Protection Organization and get that data from them. But in the meantime, we're gonna do another episode of Ask Scientist Kate. And today's letter comes from Shayla, who's in third grade in Chicago, Illinois. And her letter says, Dear Scientist Kate, I saw in the last episode that people believe climate change causes there to be more natural disasters like hurricanes and floods. Why does this happen? Thanks, Shayla. Shayla, this is a great question and a really important one. So thanks for asking. As you may know, the earth is warmed up by the light and heat of the sun. Did you already know that? I bet you did. Well, most scientists think that the earth is being warmed up slowly by human pollution. We're basically making a blanket around the earth and it's trapping in too much of the sun's heat. Kind of like when you go under the blankets in your bed and it starts to kind of get hot and stuffy in there and you need to come out for air, you know, really cool off. Well, right now we have a blanket around the earth and we're really slowly warming our planet up. And the problem with that is this. You can see on this piece of weather data that land, in orange here, we have the land and the atmosphere slowly heating up. And maybe that doesn't look too important. But if we look right here, the ocean is really heating up a lot. And that's a problem because big storms like hurricanes use the energy from the warm ocean to become very strong and powerful. Heat is a form of energy. So the energy, the heat energy in the water gets transferred to the hurricanes and the hurricanes can get really big and powerful and they can cause a lot of damage and they can even cause loss of life for humans and animals. Another problem is this, the melting of ice. So you know how the earth has a North Pole and a South Pole? Both of those poles are covered in ice caps. And as the earth warms up, that ice starts to melt. That's a problem and not just for polar bears. As that ice melts, it falls into the ocean like you're seeing in this picture, and it causes the ocean to rise because there's more water there. And when ocean levels rise, it can cause flooding for areas that are on the coast, which means areas that are near the ocean. This can damage people's houses, businesses, their property, and it can also cause loss of life for people and animals. This is a big problem. Another problem caused by climate change is desertification. Ooh, that's a big word. Desertification is a fancy science word that just means that areas that used to be really wet have become dried out. And that's a problem because many areas in the world are threatened by desertification. You can see all of these yellow places are places where the desert area is starting to spread. That's not good because we can't grow food in deserts. They're too dry and, and usually too hot. And we could run into the problem of not having enough food to feed all the people on Earth because our farmland is slowly turning into desert. That's not a good thing. So Shayla, thank you so much for asking that important question about how climate change can cause more natural disasters. Great science question. All right, thanks so much for joining me for lesson 3.6, Evaluating Evidence About Climate, 
part two. I'm gonna call up the Wildlife Protection Organization, get us that precipitation data, and we're gonna meet back here for lesson 3.7 where we are going to finally make our decision about which island is the best one for the orangutans. So I'm excited. I can't wait to see you next time. Stay safe, stay curious. Adios.